ketchup. You'll find it at every diner, every barbecue, and in 97% of U.S. homes. It's fair to say that the condiment is beloved by many as an accent to some of their favorite meals. But how much do you really know about ketchup? Because, as we'll find out, it dates back hundreds, if not thousands, of years, existing back when tomatoes were thought to be poisonous and consisting of less desirable ingredients. It's been touted as a miracle cure for countless ailments, yet determined to have led to the deaths of many who consumed it. So whether you're enjoying some fries, chicken nuggets, or the classic hot dog, don't forget to pour, squeeze, or knock out some all-American red deliciousness on top as we learn something new. Let's start at the beginning. All the way back as far as 300 BC, texts have been found that document the use of an early form of ketchup in China, and early recipes have been found dating as far back as 544 AD. Now what's important to note is that the ancestral Chinese did not have any tomatoes. Those naturally grew in the Americas. What early China did have was fish, fats from animals, and soybeans. Taking the entrails from the fish and mixing them together with the other ingredients, they developed a type of fish sauce referred to as gethup, or ketchup, by the speakers of the Southern Min dialect. Now you may think this combination sounds unappealing, but there's surprisingly little to back up the fact that they enjoyed it much either. Rather, it was made because it was a calorie-dense mixture you could add to food that could easily be stored for long voyages across the ocean. This fact allowed it to spread quickly along the trade routes to Indonesia and the Philippines, where salt was added to the mixture, improving some of the flavor. It was in the Philippines where the early British traders developed a taste for it, and in the early 1700s, promptly took back some samples with them to Europe. Now the British, who were well into the age of colonization, had imported tomato plants from South America in the 1500s, and they immediately regretted it. You see, tomatoes were quickly identified as being from the nightshade family. Nightshade plants were widely known to be very poisonous to eat, and thus were avoided at all costs. Even those who would go on to eat them would find themselves getting very sick, though many of these cases could be traced back to England's use of pewter plates made of lead. Whenever the acid from the tomato plant's juices leached lead from the plate into the food, it would give whoever tried to enjoy it an unhealthy dose of lead poisoning. But that's not to say that they didn't eat ketchup, they just didn't add the tomato. In fact, the British had many ideas to try and improve the original recipe that they had imported from the Far East. Cookbooks of the time had ketchup recipes made from everything from oysters to mussels, mushrooms to walnuts, lemons, celery, and even some fruits like plums and peaches. It seems as though they were throwing every ingredient they could at it to see what stuck and actually made it taste good. These ingredients would be boiled down to a syrup-like consistency or left in a salt mixture for an extended period of time. Both these methods would leave you with an end product that packed a solid punch of flavor that could go for a long time without going bad. But in 1812, everything would change. A scientist in Philadelphia, James Meese, had an odd infatuation with the tomato. He was working to develop his own ketchup recipe and wrote that the best form of ketchup was one derived from love apples. The addition of tomatoes helped flip public opinion on the tomato itself very quickly. No longer did the people believe tomatoes shone red with the blood of the poor souls who were unlucky enough to ingest them but instead went to the complete opposite end of the spectrum, with a doctor in Ohio named John C. Bennett deciding that he not only liked the taste of the tomato-based ketchup, he believed it was a monumental advancement in the field of medicine. He began to sell his own form, claiming it could cure ailments like rheumatism and diarrhea. People believed him, and it quickly became a fad in medicine. Bennett would even go on to work with pill manufacturers to make pill forms of his ketchup, known as extract of tomato, and people were buying it up left and right. But where there's excess demand, more suppliers will attempt to enter the market. Other medicinal ketchup producers began coming out of the woodwork, selling their own form of miracle condiments. Salespeople were touting benefits that made even Bennett's outlandish claims seem tame, going as far to say that tomatoes could even heal broken bones. But around 1850, people began to get fed up with the placebo peddlers. Studies were coming out that said there were no benefits to the ketchup, and the snake oil salesmen had their scams revealed. This was a particularly bad time for the tomato, and ketchup as well, but it was about to get much, much worse. While the early forms of pre-tomato-based ketchup were useful for their ability to be stored for long periods of time, the addition of the tomato meant that it went bad much, much quicker. In the later half of the 1800s, Americans were already used to consuming ketchup year-round, 
But the tomato season was actually quite short, usually lasting from mid-August to mid-October. This meant that ketchup could only be made fresh for about two months out of the year. But a year's worth of tomato couldn't just be made in two months, so manufacturers came up with a plan. They would preserve as much tomato pulp as they could to meet the demand throughout the year. However, like with many industries at the time, there were exceptional amounts of carelessness, filthiness, and a lack of quality control running rampant throughout. Entire barrels of pulp were stored in such poor conditions that, when opened, they would be filled with mold, yeast, spores, and all kinds of bacteria. The manufacturers weren't willing to waste their valuable pulp, however, and would often still sell it off. Sometimes, in order to prevent the ketchup from molding further, they would add things like boric acid, formalin, salicylic acid, and benzoic acid. Without going into too much detail on each of these, it's fair to say that none of them were that great for your health. This was often made worse by the fact that they were cooked in copper tubs, which could lead to a chemical reaction between the copper and the ketchup that would make it poisonous to consume. In a study on commercial ketchups conducted in 1896, just 10 years before the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 was passed, 90% of all ketchups on the market were found to contain injurious ingredients that could lead to the deaths of those that consumed them. It was around this time a man named Henry J. Hines was deciding to get in on the condiment game. He was seen by many who knew him as a man who was morally strong and was quoted as saying that heart power is better than horsepower. He formed the H.J. Hines Company, selling their first bottle of horseradish into a distrustful market in 1876. He worked hard to innovate what working at a factory could be like. Heinz employees were given free life insurance, doctor and dental services, access to on-site cafeterias, dining rooms, medical stations, swimming pools, gymnasiums, and roof gardens. But most importantly, he worked hard to make sure both his factories and his workers were meticulously clean. At a time when many factory workers didn't even have running water at home, Heinz provided fresh uniforms and a free laundry service. At a time when no one else cared, Heinz was obsessed with making his products as pure as possible. To be fair, when Heinz started, he did also use some of the methods and materials that I referred to earlier that were toxic to humans. But once he saw how gross and hazardous those concoctions became, he decided to make a change. His passion for purity in his products guided many of his business dealings. In fact, when Heinz began selling his horseradish, he refused to sell it in the brown opaque bottles common at the time. Instead, he used transparent jars so that buyers could see his horseradish's purity for themselves before they even gave him a single penny. But the recipe to make his ketchup as pure as his horseradish eluded him for nearly two decades. It wasn't until 1904 that Heinz's chief food scientist, G.F. Mason, was able to find a good preservative-free recipe for ketchup. By 1906, Heinz was producing 5 million bottles of preservative-free ketchup every year. Similarly to his horseradish, he made sure that every bottle he sold was made see-through so you could see exactly what you were buying. He also expanded his philosophy to his factories, allowing 30,000 visitors per year to tour them so they could see for themselves exactly how clean his operation was and how well his workers were treated. Today, more than 1.5 billion tons of tomatoes are produced each year with Heinz selling more than 11 billion single-serve packets and over 650 million bottles of ketchup, all in their see-through containers. If anything, ketchup is bigger now than it's ever been. The tumultuous journey of usefulness to poisonous to medicine to deadly concoction has ultimately led us to now having the second most popular condiment in the United States as of 2020. The first, mayonnaise. But that's a story for another video. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. I appreciate all the comments you've been leaving on the videos. The encouragement, likes, well wishes, and constructive criticism are what drive me to continue to try and make the best videos I can. So thanks again, and I will see you in the next one.